So we're in Mark chapter 14 today, and I want to begin by talking about the highest, uh, the highest price ever paid for a painting. It was by Leonardo da Vinci, and it sold for $450 million. So I went online yesterday, and I looked, up the, I looked at what it is, like what this painting actually looks like. And I know I wasn't in the museum or, or seeing this face to face, but I saw it on the internet, and I didn't think it was actually that good. <laughs> and I know that I'm not the one that should be giving you art advice, and that's not what I'm here to do, but I don't think I would have paid millions of dollars for something like that. I mean, I've gotten painting, paintings from my children on Father's Day that I would have a harder time parting with than this supposed masterpiece. And it makes me wonder, when I, when I hear things like that, $450 million for a painting. I, I just couldn't do it. It makes me think, who does this? And I think it's a waste of money, actually. But I think that's kind of the point, that the person who's looking at the painting is actually the one who gives it the most value. Because somebody can look at that and say, that is worth $450 million, and I'm willing to pay that to get it. They'd give up everything to get this painting. And I'd look at this painting and say, I don't know if I would have a hard time throwing it in, in the garbage. And someone is willing to give up everything for it, and the other person is willing to just let it pass by, even if it was offered to them for free. And I, and I think in a case like that, the, the, the value of something is actually more in the person who's looking at it than it is just what it is. It's a canvas with paint on it. And, and the question that I want to ask today, actually what the Bible wants to address today is ask us the question of how much value do we see in Jesus? And it can be a sobering question, but it's a good question for us to ask. What is Jesus worth to you? What is he worth? Would you be willing to give up everything, your job, your family, your comfort, even your life, to follow Jesus? Or maybe you'd give up some of those things but not everything. He's not worth everything. Or maybe you look at that and you say, he's actually, anything that would be given up for him is actually kind of a foolish thing to do. And the question we want to ask today is worshiping Jesus actually worship to you or is it a waste? And as we come to Mark chapter 14, Mark is going to give us a picture today of what it looks like, how much Jesus should be valued by someone who is following him. And so I want to read chapter 14, verses 1 to 11, and then we will dig into this. Chapter 14, verse 1. And it was now two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to arrest him by stealth and kill him. For they said, Not during the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. And while he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly, and she broke the flask and poured it over his head. There were some who said to themselves indignantly, why was this ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always will have the poor with you, and whenever you want, you can, do, you can do good for them. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. And truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray, the, betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he sought an opportunity to betray him. Now, normally when you come to a story or a narrative, what the author typically wants to do is take you from the beginning to the end to explain his point. And that's typically what we see in the Gospels uh, in terms of their narration. But when we come to this text specifically, this one isn't actually in order. We can assume that these events happened one after the other. Because in verses 1 and 2, it tells us that the chief priests and the scribes were plotting to arrest and kill Jesus. And then in verses 10 and 11, it tells us that Judas, one of Jesus' disciples, went and gave them that opportunity. Those things happen in order. But this story in the middle, verses 3 to 9, aren't so much of what happened in between this, 
but actually what happened days before. And Mark actually is going to bring this in and put this in like a, like a sandwich. And this story in the middle is actually the meat of it that helps us understand the plot and the betrayal here. So I want to start in verses 1 and 2. And, and notice that they report what we've heard many times before from the gospel. It says, And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking to arrest him by stealth and kill him. But this isn't the first time Mark's told us this. And if you've been with us uh, since I've come to this church, we've been walking our way through Mark all the way up till now. And we've heard this in chapter 3. It says, The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. So they've been doing this before. In chapter 11, it says, The chief priests and scribes were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And then in chapter 12, it says this, And they were seeking to arrest him, but feared the people. So this isn't a new thing. They've been trying to assassinate Jesus for a while now, but they haven't been able to accomplish this goal. And in the meantime, the longer they've taken, the more that Jesus' popularity has gone viral. And so because of that, they're worried, and they say in verse 2, Not during the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. And so Mark's not actually here giving us the chronology of what happened. He's more interested in the theology of what he's trying to tell us. This plot is not that they're just starting to do this now. It's that they are invigorated again to say, we need to do this. And we need to do it as soon as possible. But Mark tips us off to the fact that in verse 1 it says, It was now two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened, Unleavened Bread. So that means it was Wednesday. And on Thursday, it was the the biggest celebration, the biggest feast of the Jewish calendar. And there were tons of people flocking to Jerusalem to celebrate this seven-day feast. Thursday was the day where they would eat the Passover. And people were coming, and this would make uh, Jerusalem swell with people. And the surrounding towns would have thousands of people. They estimate that over 100,000 people would be coming to Jerusalem just for this festival alone. And because the population would become so great, there were a lot of nervous people, like the chief priests and the temple police, who would see so many more people and be cautious and nervous that something might happen. Even the Romans stationed soldiers throughout the city in case there was an uprising. And when you get to the the point where Jesus is arrested and he's brought to Herod and Pilate, normally they wouldn't be there. But in in the Passover... These people also would come and move in and and live in Jerusalem during this time just in case something were to happen. And so you see that it's not just the regular people that live in Jerusalem that are a threat to the chief priest if they were to arrest and kill Jesus. It was the fact that they said, not during the feast lest there be an uproar from these hundreds of thousands of people. And during this time, it was typical that the anticipation of the Messiah appearing would be at the Passover time. People would just kind of expect it. And so there was all of these opportunities for things to go really bad. Yet we know that because of God's omnipotent sovereignty, His plan of salvation for mankind cannot be thwarted no matter what kind of planning these people do. And even though from the beginning of history, regardless of how secretive and and conniving these chief priests and scribes, scribes are, They can't change God's plan. And we find out here that it was God's plan that this Passover was the time when Jesus would be put to death. When the Messiah would come and he would die in the place of sinners. And since the very first Passover, since they ate it in Egypt as slaves, and God commanded his people to select and slaughter a pure and spotless lamb, so that its precious blood would be smeared on the doorposts of their homes, that when the Lord came and struck down the firstborn of every household, they, those who believed, those who obeyed God's command to put the blood on the doorposts, only those households were spared. And in the same way, this finally has come to the fulfillment where Jesus becomes this Passover lamb. Jesus is here. That's why Mark tells us when this took place. The chief priests and scribes are saying it can't happen this week. And God has always said it's going to happen this week. There is no way to change this. And so when those who see that the Lord is coming to strike down those who have unforgiven sin, only those who are covered by the Passover lamb, Jesus Christ, 
will be covered, will be spared, will be passed over at Judgment Day. And so when we see in verse 2 that they said not during the feast, we know that God is unstoppable. And this plan of theirs was destined to fail. And as the events unfold, as we go to the end of this book, we're going to see how each story, each section is like a step toward the cross of Christ. Jesus himself is actually going to comment a few times that this, everything that happens, these surprising events are all happening according to plan. He's going to foretell that one of his disciples will betray him. He's going to foretell that the rest of them are all going to fall away. And when he's arrested like a criminal, each time Jesus says, let the scriptures be fulfilled. So long ago, God was orchestrating that all of these things would take place. That one day, his very own son, the Messiah, the Passover lamb of God, would be put to death. And this is why Jesus came. Jesus came determined to die. And with this background, we enter into the last hours of Jesus' life towards the death of Christ. And what Mark wants to contrast here is the difference between those who understand Jesus and who he was and what he came to do and those who are confused about Jesus, which is often the disciples, and those who reject him altogether. And the focus in verse 3, it, it shifts completely. And it focuses on a woman, an unnamed woman, who takes the opportunity to honor Jesus with what she had, the greatest possible way that she could imagine. And that's what we see here. The same event is told by Matthew and by John. And there's details that we get from those Gospels that we wouldn't have gotten if we, all we had was Mark's Gospel. We learn that Mary was actually the woman who did this. And she was the sister of Martha and Lazarus. It's possible that they were at her home in Bethany. We also see that, that this event actually took six days so it took place six days before the Passover, and here we see that Mark has already said that it's two days before. So this was inserted into the story, not because it happened next, but because Mark has a plan here. And even though we can find out these other details from Matthew and John, we can find out who said what and, and how it happened, we need to understand that when we come to Mark's gospel, we don't need those, those pieces of information to understand what he's trying to tell us. Sometimes it's helpful to understand that, but if all we had was Mark's gospel, we would still have enough. So he doesn't name the woman. He doesn't name any disciples. And, and, and one other thing that we need to do as good readers of the Bible is to ask the question then, if he knew who these people were, then why didn't he name them? Maybe there's a point to the fact that he doesn't name these people. So let's look at verse 3 now. And we need to ask ourselves, what does Mark emphasize here? We look at verse 3 and it says, And while he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly, and she broke the flask and poured it over his head. Now even in our day, this is a surprising thing. It seems a little bit odd, and it was in that day as well. This is supposed to surprise us, because in those days, a woman wasn't supposed to come into a room where men were eating unless she were coming to serve the food. Furthermore, it was customary that, that someone would anoint a person when they entered into their house. It was an act of hospitality. But normally it was put on their feet because in those days they would walk on dusty paths all the time in either bare feet or in sandals. So that was just something that they would do when you came over. So to the people in the room, watching this woman do this and, and not come in to do things according to the custom was surprising. And actually what we see is that they think she's irresponsible, that she's reckless with what she's doing. On top of this, Mark describes the ointment in verse 3. And I want you to notice how much detail he gives us in this verse, just about the ointment. He wants us to know that the flask was made out of alabaster, which was a fine marble from Egypt, which would have been very expensive. He wants us to know that the ointment was of nard, which was from a plant in India that was expensive, again, to, to import it all the way to Israel. He wants us to know that the ointment was pure nard. He says that, which means that it wasn't diluted, which means that when they use it, it would have been more expensive. He wants us to know, if we didn't know already, he even explicitly says this was very costly. So the expense, the value of this, this perfume is, is at the center of what Mark wants us to see. In verse 5, someone estimates its worth as more than a year's wages, which in our day could 
value at maybe more than $50,000. Can you imagine? And this is what Mark wants us to see. This was the most expensive thing by far in this house, let alone in the area, perhaps. And beyond its monetary value, there, this was likely an, an, a family heirloom, which was passed on through the generations from mother to daughter as this continued. And, and perhaps that's where it got most of, its, most of its value anyways. So it's worth a lot of money. It means a lot to this family. And this is what Mark wants us to know that she brought to Jesus this day. She brings it, and then it says this. She broke the flask, and she poured it all over his head. In one outrageous moment, this woman spends every ounce of monetary and sentimental value. And all that was left was of the shattered marble glass, or flask was this precious ointment, which was now on Jesus, and it could fill the room with its smell. That's all that was left of it. And of all that this passage talks about, this is the verse. This is the focus of everything here. And what Mark wants us to do is to understand what just took place. Why does he tell us this? Why do we need to know this? All these details. And what he does is show us how people respond. In verses 4 and 5, it's the response of some in the room. And we can assume that the disciples were a part of that. But he just says, some in the room said this. But then Jesus, in verses 6 to 9, tells us what he thinks. And so what we need to do is understand these responses to this. And what I ask you now, I'll ask you again later, is how do you respond to something like this? Look at verse 4. It says that there were some who were indignant. This means that they were disturbed to their core. That they were resentful towards this woman. It's not just they were thinking like, what, what is she doing? They're mad. So I want you to imagine that. They're mad at her. You can hear it in their words. They don't ask her, so what, what does this mean? Why did you do this? They, they angrily assume and they demand an explanation. They say, why was this ointment wasted like that? There's probably a lot of ways that you could have devastated this woman in a moment like this. But this, this was enough. And in their opinion, this was a complete waste. That's what they say. They say they, you destroyed it. it it's, it's gone. It doesn't mean anything anymore. That's how they see this. Think of all the wonderful things that you could have done if you would have sold it or maybe given it to, to other people to share it. And, and verse 5 tells us what they had in mind. It says, For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. Now in John's gospel, we can gain a, a couple insights when we're told that it was Judas who said this. And none of you are surprised. It also tells us in John's Gospel that Judas was in charge of the money between G Jesus and his disciples. He kind of held the bag or wherever they would have hidden this stuff. And it also tells us that, G that Judas was stealing from the money bag. And with that information, you can understand why I leave it to Judas to take this beautiful image of honoring God and he translates it into dollars and cents. Not because he's concerned about the poor, but because he's thinking, how much of that $50,000 could have been mine? But it's not just Judas. There's other people that are talking here. And what we do know, we don't need to know that it's Judas. We need to know that there were some people who responded to this woman's extravagant act, extravagant way of honoring her Lord. And what they did was they scolded her. And just like a bull that snorts and stomps before it's charged, this is what the disciples were doing. They were scolding her. And this is why Jesus responds in verse 6 with a command. He says, leave her alone. And then he questions their motives. He says, he says why do you trouble her? And then he, gets, he gives his own interpretation of what happened, which is completely opposite. He says, she has done a beautiful thing to me. Beautiful? This isn't beautiful. This is a waste. So what does Jesus see? underneath that flowing fragrance that we don't see. His reason is given in verse 7. This is what he says. He says, For you will always have the poor with you, and whenever you want, you can do good for them. But you will not always have me. So Jesus is not saying that he is worth blessing and the poor are not. Some people have taken it to understand that the poor, Jesus doesn't care about the poor. But that's obviously not true based on his ministry and his commands to us. But the difference that he's making, actually, you see it in the words. He says, you will always have the poor. And then he contrasts that with, but you will not always have me. 
So what we're talking about here is the opportunity that this woman has. There are opportunities all the time to help the poor. Even today, there's always poor. They're everywhere, and it's all the time that we can do this. And it should be a genuine concern of every believer. But when it comes to Jesus, the opportunity to honor God, the, the Son of God, in the flesh has come and gone. We don't have that opportunity for us today. And so Jesus is actually predicting here that his days are few. And it's, it's actually more helpful to measure his time left in hours at this point than in days. And regardless of how much this woman actually knew about this death that was coming, she, uh, she knew that she loved him so much that it led her to do what she could with what she had to honor him. She had to do this. And Mark actually says in verse 8, she has done what she could. And and literally, Mark writes in the Greek, what she had, she did. That's as simple as it was. She didn't do anything that she couldn't. She didn't do less than she had. She did with what she could. No, she, she did with what she had. Jesus identifies this woman's extravagant act of worship of him as timelessly beautiful. That's what he says. This will be beautiful, not just today, not just in that moment, but forever. What she did here, even though it was her heart overflowing with gratitude, she was so thankful, so loving of her Savior and her Lord that she does this, but she did more than I think she even knew. Jesus says in verse 8, she has anointed my body beforehand for burial. Because Jesus was, was arrested and tried and crucified and buried so quickly, there was no time for anyone to anoint his body for burial. And when the women on the third day go to do the job, Jesus is already resurrected. And so what she does here is way more than any one of us perhaps could have imagined. And this is exactly why we're still talking about her today. Look at verse 9. And truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. So at opposite ends of the spectrum, this one act is interpreted as wonderful worship and worthless waste. And what makes us decide whether it's one or the other is how much we value Jesus. And I know that we, we don't have the details in Mark's gospel. We can find out that it was Mary and, and Judas, but maybe that's why Mark doesn't name them. He wants us to identify with ourselves, ourselves with someone in the story. So he doesn't name them. When you hear Mary and you hear Judas, you want to be like Mary. I'm like Mary, and I have no inkling to be like Judas. That's what we often think. And so without naming them, he just says, there was a woman who did this, and then some people responded like this. So where do you fit in? What value do you give to Jesus? Or what value, what worth do you see Jesus having? So Mark presents this question for us, for his readers. What do you think? Do you think it was worship? Does this look like your own life? Or do you think it was a waste? Mark's given us an example of what it means to follow Christ. It means that Jesus will mean more, will be worth more than anything else in this world. And when you see him as your Lord and Savior, the Son of God, When you see Jesus as the humble, suffering Passover lamb for you, that his blood will cover you so that you are passed over when God judges the world, that when you see through the eyes of faith, you see Jesus Christ poured out for you, that is when you will pour yourself out for him. And the watching world is going to see our worship, our honoring him, our thanking him, our praising him, and they're going to say it's a waste. It's a waste of time to go to church. It's going to be a waste of, of money to give for the kingdom of God. It's going to be a waste of, of opportunities, a waste of your job if you have to quit because, of, because you follow Christ. It's going to be a waste of family, time, or effort, or, or all of this thing. They're going to say it's a waste, but to the eyes and the heart of a believer, seeing their Savior who died for them, that is what gives us or drives us to worship him. And so the point I see here is that our worship of Jesus depends on how much worth he has to us. So think about how you worship him. And I'm not just talking about Sunday mornings. 
just with our lives. What is Jesus worth? And does your life back that up? Does, it, does your life prove that that's the answer? In verses 10 and 11, it moves the plot one step closer to the death of Christ. And what's interesting in verse 10 is that it tells us, yes, it was Judas, but look at how he describes him. He was one of the twelve. I know we know this, but think about it. One of the twelve went and betrayed Jesus. The three years of Jesus' teaching was still in his ears. The, the, the memory of this event was still in his mind. The scent of the perfume could have still been in his jacket. And yet Judas valued money, valued everything else more than Jesus. He knew that there was a hunting party that was dispatched to assassinate his rabbi. And verse 11 tells us of a despicable thing. It says that Judas made the chief priests glad. He made them glad. And he said that he would use his friendship to betray his friend to them. In exchange for money, Judas began to do what the chief priests and scribes were doing, and he was plotting how to kill Jesus by stealth as well. And what we see here is the difference between a woman and this man, Judas. And that's what I want to I show us today. An unnamed woman... They're so different. An unnamed woman in a, in a culture where she really had no status versus a man with a name, Judas. He names him. And he's one of the 12 disciples. There's a huge difference between them. She gave to Jesus what she could. And Judas is here taking from Jesus what he could. She blessed her Lord while he betrayed his Lord. She loved him and he used him. She did a beautiful thing, and Judas did a terrible thing. She served Jesus as her Savior, but he sold him like a slave. And because of this, she will be remembered forever for worship, and Judas will never be forgotten for his betrayal. So let's make this personal here. It's possible, it's possible that there are some people in this room today, in the church today, that are just like Judas. Uh, think about it. Like Judas, you can know the Bible inside out. You, you can know Jesus. You can follow, accept the invitation to follow Jesus and still, like Judas, not be saved. Like Judas, you can be seen by others as a model Christian. He was one of the 12 disciples. You could be in a position of leadership. He was one of the 12 disciples, and yet he was not saved. Like Judas, you can listen to biblical truth every day. And you can understand all the parables and all these, these difficult texts in the Bible and yet still not be saved. You can perform miracles in the, with the power of God. You can see miracles. You can even see people coming to Christ and still not be saved, just like Judas. You can call Jesus your Lord and your Savior and yet still not be saved. You can even serve on the finance committee and still not be saved. It is a dangerous thing to assume that you are forgiven because you have a desire to be, I want to be forgiven, or, or because I have a feeling that, yeah, I think I'm forgiven, or maybe because you got baptized and you go to church. That is not what saves you. What saves you is faith in Christ and his death on the cross for our forgiveness and his resurrection for our eternal life. So in this congregation, there might be some that are just like Judas, that think they're saved, that think they're a part of something, or that it just appear that they're a part of something, and they're not. But the way to be certain is to question whether you have faith in the Son of God as your Passover lamb. And you, many of us in this room perhaps, are just like this woman. To have a heart where sin's root has been severed, but that, that only happens through faith in Christ. To have a mind that thinks about ways to honor Jesus. But that only happens through faith in Christ. To have eyes to recognize him as the Son of God, to see him as your Passover lamb, to see and say that his blood covers my sin. And that only happens through faith in Christ. To love Jesus more than life itself, but only through faith. 
to be so bold that you don't fear the criticism of other people, but rather that you would want to receive the commendation of Christ himself. How beautiful our worship is. How confident we can be when we know who our Savior is, when we know what our Savior has done, and we know that we, by our faith, have been forgiven and received eternal life. Our faith must be in Jesus plus nothing. And so you can't truly honor him if you don't, if you just think that you should. You can't truly worship him if you just think that that's the right thing to do. I need to do that, and that's what will happen. You, you can't truly praise him if you just want to fit in with other believers. You need to have a change. And the only way that that takes place is when you understand the gospel, the good news of what Jesus has done for you. And like that flask that was broken, your heart is broken over the sin that you commit daily. That's in your heart that runs your life. And when you realize that, out of your broken heart, like the perfume, your gratitude and your praise and your, your, the worth of Christ, you just pour out yourself for him. And that's the picture I want us to see this morning. That when we understand who Christ really is, then we will value him. And when we value him because of that, then we will truly worship him the way that he deserves. And so as we sing one more song before this service is over. I want you, before you open your mouth to sing, I want you to open your hearts and I want you to examine what's really there. Where does Jesus rank? What value does he have in your life? And before you speak any of the words in that song, I want you to speak to God and confess that you, how worthy he is and how you have failed to worship him as he deserves. And before you leave today, I want you to take those things that you valued, that you love more than Christ, and I want you to leave them at the foot of the cross, in the shadow of your Passover lamb. And as you lift your voice, I want you to lift your eyes to the crucified Christ again, the risen Christ, and put your faith in him alone. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Thank you for the gospel. Thank you that there is a way that we can know that we are saved from our sin. That, our, that sin and death does no longer have any power over us because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ for us. Thank you that you had a plan from before the foundation of the world that on the Passover that he died, that was everything. Everything that happened according to plan. You orchestrated it perfectly, and nothing could change that. And when we now look to Christ, even 2,000 years later, we see our Passover lamb. And because of his blood that was poured out for many, and by our faith in him and you, we are saved. I pray for many people here to question, to examine themselves. It's not a bad thing to do this, to question whether they truly are in the faith. And that they would know with certainty this morning, that because of Christ, and because they truly value him as he should be, as their salvation, as their savior, as their God, as their Lord, that they would know and walk away today in full assurance that they are saved. And that they would live their lives to live according to your word, according to what you've commanded us, not because they have to, but because they want to. May your spirit transform hearts as we sing this one more song. And may people come up to the front and pray with those that need to talk about this and to be prayed with. And may we be a church that takes that step and, and looks at Christ and values him more than anything else that this world can offer, more than anything else that this world can threaten us, that we would love Christ more than all. We thank you for him. We thank you for our salvation. And we say together that it is worth more than anything anywhere. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.